Welcome back. I hope you've all had time to return. I'm happy to present our next uh, speaker, Patty Oikawa, who is a assistant professor in the Earth and Environmental Sciences Department at Cal State East Bay. Thank you, Thank you for having me today. Um, I'm very excited to be part of this panel. I'll be talking about carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas budgets in tidal wetlands in the Bay Area. Okay, so I'm going to start out with an introduction to the carbon markets that we have here in California and um, the role that wetlands can play in helping to fight climate change. Um, and then I'll really do a brief um, review of carbon cycling in tidal wetlands and then a discussion of a couple of uh, case studies that we've been studying in the Bay Area. So um, just to remind everyone um, about where we are with climate change right now, uh, we have to reach carbon neutrality by the year 2045, 2050, around there, um, in order to avoid over exceeding one and a half degrees Celsius warming. And this figure on the lower left is showing, um, is from the IPCC report, and this is for global CO2 emissions, um, where we need to hit neutrality here, followed by very significant um, and prolonged negative um, carbon emissions. And by negative emissions, we mean active removal of CO2 out of the atmosphere and storing that in land and also geologic reservoirs. Um, and this is the figure on the right is from a, um, a report that came out recently for just the state of California. And we have a goal here of reaching neutrality by 2045, which is going to be very difficult to achieve without negative emissions. Again, these um, technologies that we can use to store carbon in land and geologic reservoirs. So in California, one of the ways that we're trying to fight climate change is with carbon market systems. And for those of you who are, who are not familiar with these, um, we have in California compliance market, which means um, it is imposed um, by the government on our industrial greenhouse gas emitters. Um, and they have a certain amount of alliance uh, or allowance of emissions that they're allowed to emit every year. And that allowance goes down over time as we try and wean people away from fossil fuels. Um, if, you, if you are an industrial emitter and you exceed your allowance for that year, you can um, offset those emissions and invest in um, wetland restoration or other types of land management strategies that actively remove carbon from the atmosphere and store them in soils. Um, and the American Carbon Registry is the um, institution that or organization that oversees the compliance carbon market here in California. And I helped co-author a greenhouse gas um, offset methodology, which kind of outlines all the steps that you would need to take to estimate the greenhouse gas um, budget or impact of a wetland in the San Francisco Bay Delta region. And this was approved and adopted by the American Carbon Registry and was recently recommended by the California Air Resources Board for adoption in the compliance market. Um, this methodology has already been implemented and started to be used as of last year. Um, and it was the first um, adoption of that or implementation of that methodology was by the California Department of Water Resources, where they had a 1700 acre restoration project in, in the Delta on, on Sherman Island. Um, and through the voluntary carbon market, which is where this protocol is operating right now, um, for that project, they're receiving about $62 per acre per year for that project. But once this is adopted into the compliance market, um, we'll be likely seeing much, um, much greater financial support around $200 to $300 an, an acre. And there are a lot more projects right now. This is very exciting in the pipeline in particularly in the Delta, which we haven't talked about much today, but um, there's a lot of interest in there in that region for wetland restoration, but it's also um, applicable, applicable to Delta uh, tidal wetlands in the Bay as well. Um, so I'm gonna now take a second and review carbon cycling in tidal wetlands in particular. 
um, and, and exactly how are they helping us fight climate change. So um, carbon cycling in wetlands happens both atmospherically or vertically and also horizontally. So we have greenhouse gas exchange in the form of carbon dioxide and methane. So CO2 is actively removed from the atmosphere through um, photosynthesis by the plant community. Um, and then the, the soils and plants do release some amounts of CO2 and methane. And a methane is of, of course an important greenhouse gas. We also have this lateral transport of carbon. Um, and this is um, through um, you know, tidal flow into and out of these systems. So we have some gain and loss of carbon that way as well. And then we of course have sequestration of carbon in our soils. Um, and this is stored in our sediments and can be stored for you know, millennial timescales. So this is very long-term carbon storage, the type of carbon storage that we really need um, to help fight climate change. Okay, so if you want to understand, you know, the whole role of how tidal wetlands play um, in regards to helping fighting climate change, you really need to get an estimate of all these different types of movements of carbon. Um, so here in the Bay Area, we have a couple case studies where we're measuring these, um, these carbon flows. And um, the two main techniques we're using for this are um, for atmospheric uh, is for eddy covariance, which is a technique where we have instruments mounted in the field above the canopy in the wetland installed permanently. And they measure continuous concentrations of greenhouse gases like methane and CO2. And we co-vary um, those concentrations with vertical wind velocity. This is a sonic anemometer here. And from these measurements, we um, can measure the ex atmospheric exchange of these greenhouse grass gases across the landscape. So this is um, an example here of the, of the eddy covariance tower and it's measuring out and integrating across a pretty large spatial area around 500 square meters, um, more or less, depending on the wind conditions. And then we also are measuring the lateral carbon exchange. So again, this is the carbon that's flowing in and out of the wetland um, with the water. And so for this, it's kind of a similar approach where we're permanently installing these sensors. Um, in this case, it's in the water in the tidal channel. Um, and we measure instead of air um, velocity, we're measuring water velocity and we're keeping track of how much water comes in and out and also measure um, proxies for the different types of carbon that's in the water. So the particulate, organic carbon, dissolved organic carbon and dissolved inorganic carbon such as dissolved CO2. And then we can calculate the mass volume of water with these concentrations of carbon species and get um, see how much carbon is coming in and leaving. And because all of these measurements are continuous sensors that are mounted in the field, we can sum that up over the course of the year and get this annual budget. So, okay, this year, the wetland sequestered this much carbon dioxide, it released this much methane, it lost this much carbon laterally or gained it, right? So it helps us with this um, kind of carbon accounting, if you will. So the two sites I'm gonna talk about today are first in um, Susan Bay, and we call this um, Rush Ranch. And if you look at the whole map of the Bay Area here, Susan Bay is right up in here, and this is the location of um, the, the field site. This is on Solano Land Trust, and it's part of the San Francisco Bay National, National Estuarian Research Reserve. And this is a photo of our eddy covariance tower. This is a tower that's run by the USGS under uh, Lisa Marie Wyndham Myers' group. Um, and they've had this tower out here measuring atmospheric greenhouse gas exchange since 2014. So they have many years of data now, which is fabulous. And it's right here at the edge of the marsh and integrating across this um, large land service here, we have westerly winds. So as the wind comes over the marsh, we're, we're measuring that greenhouse gas exchange. And then um, for the lateral fluxes, we have um, instruments installed here in the main tidal channel that drains um, this whole uh, marsh complex. Um, and so that has also been maintained by the USGS um, since 2018. 
Um, and this is not a restored wetland. This is a historic uh, brackish marsh um, system that's about nine parts per thousand in salinity. So we call it mesohaline. So it's pretty low on the salinity profile um, because it's closer to the delta up in the North Bay. The other site is Eden Land and Ecological Reserve, which we've um, touched on a couple times already today in the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. Um, and so this is again Rush Ranch up here. Eden Landing is way down here in the Hayward um, shoreline, really close to Cal State East Bay where I work. Um, and so I've been I installed a tower out here in this um, in this marsh in 2018. And we installed the hydrologic flux station in just this past year in 2020. Um, and so here's the location of the tower. And this is Mount Eden Creek Marsh. It's one particular part of this restoration complex that was restored um, from salt ponds to marsh in around 2008. Um, and then our lateral flux station is out here in the tidal channel that drains this part of the marsh. Um, and the salinity regime is very, very different here compared to Rush Ranch, where over 30 parts per thousand salinity, very, very saline um, wetland compared to the North Bay marsh here. Okay, so then I'll, I just wanted to give you guys a snapshot of the greenhouse gas fluxes that we see in these two case studies here. And um, Eden Landing data are on the left and Rush Ranch data are on the right. And these are cumulative CO2 and methane fluxes. So the CO2 fluxes are on the top graphs. And these are in grams carbon um, per meter squared. And negative numbers in this case mean active removal of CO2 from the atmosphere into the ecosystem. So we are removing in Eden Landing around 400 grams of carbon in the form of CO2 in every square meter of soil over the course of the year. And for Rush Ranch, and again, we have a little bit more data here for Rush Ranch, it's about 300. So they're very, very strong carbon sinks. Um, and this is not surprising. We know this is true from other studies, not just in the Bay Area, but from all around the world that tidal wetlands are really good at um, sequestering carbon. Um, the methane signals are extremely small. These are almost um, near our detection limits for these methods. It's about half of a gram of carbon in the form of methane in every square meter of soil at the end of the year. And for rush rants, we're, we're about 0.9. This is about two orders of magnitude lower methane emissions from these tidal wetlands than you would see from a freshwater wetland system such as some of those that we have up way up in the Delta, which is completely fresh water, lots of methane out of those systems. But in tidal wetlands, when you have some amount of salinity, uh, methane usually is very inhibited. And that's from the biogeochemistry that happens with that salt water that comes into the wetland and um, the um, microbial activity in the soils. But basically methane turns off once you reach a certain salinity profile and we really see that in both of our wetlands here is basically no methane coming out. Okay, so the USGS team has um, um, the, the lateral fluxes and the atmospheric fluxes for Rush Ranch and they published this in Matt Bogart's paper in, in 2020 where they put all this together for the first time. So integrating the atmospheric and the lateral um, and they found that about 50% of what we're removing atmospherically, so 50% of that CO2 that we see being taken up by the wetland gets lost um, through tidal flow and half of it stays basically. And so um, half of it again is stored in the soil, half of it gets flowed out into the bay and mostly in the form of dissolved inorganic carbon. So things like dissolved CO2, carbonate, and bicarbonate. And um, really what we need to do now and what we're working on with this project um, is to expand this analysis beyond one year. So we wanna look at this over a few years to get a better sense of uh, what regulates these fluxes. Um, and then we're um, doing the same type of integration of atmospheric and lateral flux 
measurements at Eden Landing. And with our preliminary data analysis so far, we're seeing a really similar type of dynamic at Eden Landing, where about half of the carbon is staying and half of it is getting lost. So if we were gonna do a real back of the envelope upscaling, and I can't emphasize more that this is really back of the envelope, but just to give a sense, because a lot of people don't think about grams of carbon, um, this is, you know, assuming that about half of the carbon that we're seeing um, taken up by the wetland is staying. So again, that's about 200 grams. Um, and if you were to upscale this to the entire ecological reserve, which is about 6,400 acres. Again, there are, these are all, this is all you know, diverse wetland here. So again, very back of the envelope. We'd be removing about 5,000 metric tons of carbon from the atmosphere every year into this complex. And it's similar to taking 4,000 cars off the road. So we're talking about pretty substantial um, carbon credits here and um, a very strong and viable way of fighting climate change. So we've talked a lot today about how important wetlands are for sea level rise, but they're also just important for fighting the actual um, base of the problem, which is climate change itself and, and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So um, for future work, things that we really have our eye on over the next year or two are better constraining these DIC fluxes. This is um, super interesting to me and I spent a lot of time thinking about this, but about, like I said, half of that CO2 that you're removing from the atmosphere is getting lost laterally. And it's really interesting because that carbon is getting exported out into the bay and into the coastal oceans. And this is in the form again of CO2 carbonate and bicarbonate. And if, the, if it's mostly in the form of CO2, it's very likely to get re-released out into the atmosphere. So again, that we would call that a carbon neutral situation where the, where the ecosystem takes CO2 out of the atmosphere and then it laterally goes out into the ocean and it goes back into the atmosphere, okay, neutral. But if a lot of the DIC is being lost in the form of carbonate or bicarbonate, it's much more likely to stay in the oceans and actually be a long-term carbon sink, just like the carbon that you're seeing in the soil sediments in the wetland. And it also helps um, reduce acidification of oceans, which is another big problem that we have with climate change. So this is something I'm really interested in and preliminary data from Eden Landing shows that a lot of this DIC flux is in the bicarbonate form. So this is something we're gonna be tracking and investigating more. We also again wanna look at this over multiple years and then we're gonna take all this information and build it into a biogeochemical model and publish the model online in an accessible format. And this is something we're hoping to achieve within the next year is getting, you know, a lot of people, a lot of wetlands don't have this kind of data. It's pretty complicated and hard to collect. So what we wanna do is use that information and build it into a model so that other tidal wetland projects in the Bay can uh, punch some numbers into that model and get their estimates of greenhouse gas budgets and things like that um, so that they can participate in carbon markets. So to summarize, um, tidal wetlands remove a lot of carbon from the atmosphere, they store it in their soils, about half of it stays, half of it leaves. Um, salinity ranges that we've looked at from about nine to 35 parts per thousand show negligible methane emissions. We have protocols available to help us finance wetland restoration in the Bay Delta, and this has been recommended for adoption in the compliance market. And so overall, um, tidal wetland restoration is a natural climate solution that can play a significant role in how we fight climate change. Um, and with that, I'd just like to thank my collaborators here in the Delta Stewardship Council who funded this work, um, Salina Land Trust, the NUR, and CDFW and South Bay Salt Pond for hosting us. And here are just some pictures of my colleagues. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Patty. Uh, next up, we have Valerie Bloom. Uh, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In 2019, she joined the San Francisco Bay Delta Field Office and serves as the Bay Restoration Regulatory Integration Team uh, member from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, good morning. Um, thank you for that, James. And um, yeah, as James noted, I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of the San Francisco Bay um, 
Delta office in Sacramento. Mm-hmm. And so we've heard from a lot of speakers today and will over the next couple of days um, speaking on a variation of the theme um, of how important our San Francisco estuary is and how important it is that we need to adapt to climate change. I was asked to speak about the value of the wetlands to federally listed uh, species that were listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, but first, a little about my background. Um, I started out with the state and with several environmental consulting firms. And then, as James noted, um, I now work for the service. I've been with the service about 20 years now and recently uh, moved to, um, I started working for the BRIT. It's a mouthful. It's the Bay Restoration Regulatory Integration Team. Um, It's composed of three state and three federal agencies. And then we have an oversight committee um, made up of managers from each of those agencies. And EPA is also, um, as you'll see, their um, logo is not below. That was an oversight on my part, but they are um, participating on an ad hoc basis. And the reason for the establishment of the BRIT was to improve the permitting process um, to create efficiencies so that uh, for these multi-benefit restoration projects, including those with flood um, management elements and public access um, infrastructure. And it covers the whole nine uh, Bay Area County that um, rings the Bay. We work mainly on Measure AA projects or those that are eligible for Measure AA funding, um, the initiative that was passed in 2016. uh, Someone mentioned that earlier. Uh, And the idea behind, um, again, our our, um, establishment was to increase efficiencies um, in the permitting process. So we're held to the same, the projects are held to the same mandates um, that uh, if you didn't go through the BRIT process, but we um, focus on early collaboration, pre-application. And so there's early and often coordination and we can head off uh, those conflicts that may arise later in the process. And all of this um, complements two new state initiatives I'll uh, mention briefly later in the presentation. So um, you've seen these figures um, already or some version of them and we'll probably see them over the next couple of days, but it's a good reminder that uh, on the left, um, this is looking at about the year 1800 and, and the establishment of, or the, um, the presence of tidal marsh in green there. And then you can see on the right, um, showing the present in 2009 anyway, um, not a lot of green. So we've had a drastic reduction in tidal marsh um, habitats in the Bay. And that was mainly from urbanization of the area, um, conversion to agriculture and um, development of industrial and residential areas. Um, And it it did bring economic success to the area, but also um, came at a huge loss. Um, And, you know, in the middle, I I realize you can't read the the fine print on that, but um, as others have said, and as um, Patty enumerated, the sea level rise projections, three of them are shown here, different um, gas emission scenarios. And the point is that none of them are good. Uh, We're looking at a meter to a meter and a half um, or more by 2100. And so that has caused um, up to 90% loss of tidal marsh habitat. Uh, in the Bay. So um, out of that came a, out of the knowledge of this huge loss um, of habitat uh, and other functions in the Bay that I'll get to in a minute, the San Francisco Bay Shoreline Adaptation Atlas um, that Julie presented uh, in 2019 was published and um, this quote I thought was very poignant and it's that as the climate continues to change, San Francisco Bay shoreline communities will need to adapt in order to build social and ecological resilience to rising sea levels. And then even more uh, pointed down below from the Bayland Ecosystem Habitat Goals Science Update in 2015, um, stating, you know, calling out the year 2030 that um, tidal marshes that are established by 2030 are more likely to provide ongoing benefits uh, when sea level rise accelerates at mid-century. And so to do that, the planning, permitting, and construction um, of restoration projects must be accelerated. Because this guy can't get any higher in the pickleweed over here. <laughs> Let's see, so what are those functions that uh, tidal marshes 
provide and that we lost and need to retain? Um, and, and why do we need to retain those marshes moving forward? Well, because of the services that have already been discussed um, in detail by others, uh, water filtration and purification, um, which Christina Toms is on next, I believe, and she's very knowledgeable. Uh, this is her wheelhouse, so uh, we will be good to hear from her uh, on that. And then, you know, tidal marshes present um, lots of opportunities for recreation in the bay, hiking, biking, um, fishing, bird watching, um, and then the flood control, natural flood control and protection uh, services that a tidal marsh provides. Um, we really need to manage those um, appropriately so that we can um, pr protect our communities. And then nutrient cycling, which Patty spoke to also, um, is, is an important function of the tidal marsh. And then what I'm here to talk about today, which is the wildlife habitat um, benefits of protecting um, and maintaining tidal marsh around the bay. Um, you know, it does support, the tidal marsh does support um, so many native species uh, and non-native, unfortunately. Um, but I'm here to talk about the endangered species that are supported. And these are, these are species um, in this slide that are very dependent on the tidal marsh. I should mention that there are others like California least tern and um, Delta smelt and Western snowy plover and others that are federally listed under the Endangered Species Act, but um, and use tidal marsh to some extent during their life cycle, but these are really dependent on, extremely dependent on the tidal marsh. Um, and here's a summary of the threats um, that exist to their, their survival and that caused them to um, be listed in the first place in the 70s into the 80s. So habitat loss from development that we've talked about a lot now, um, and including the freshwater discharges that change the salinity regime um, can, can affect these species as well. And all that development um, can fragment, has fragmented the, po the populations and um, the distribution of populations. And that is key, the connectivity of, of these populations is, is really key to their survival. We've talked a lot about sea level rise that obviously has, um, degraded and and caused the loss completely of uh, habitat for these species. Also with development came increased predation pressure. Um, you bring people that brings trash to an area and things like raccoons and gulls um, just explode in population when you have when you have that. Uh, a lot of the levees that were put in um, can be predator highways that um, in the two species here on this slide are seem to be delicious to predators like that. So um, that has had a major effect in the Bay. And then with development came um, movement of plant species and we've had non-native um, plant species invasions to contend with too. Um, so what do the species need to survive and to thrive? Uh, well, they need amelioration of the threats just listed. Um, but in particular, cover is is huge for the, for the animal species um, and they need that you know, with the development around the bay, we're already working with such a narrow band um, at that high marsh upland ecotone. And so with sea level rise, just makes the point even clearer that um, these species really need restoration to uh, put back that high tide refugia, either at that ecotone with the uplands or on the marsh plain um, in terms of, you know, adding some topography, we call them marsh mounds. Um, for the species to, to escape into and hide from, hide from predators. They also need foraging lands um, with properly functioning hydrology um, so that they drain and, and can, they can forage on the, on the mud flats and the tidal sloughs. They need for nesting relatively undisturbed areas um, and that can be a challenge in a place as developed as the bay. Um, again, they, they need a lack of predators um, or relative lack of predators um, and then as far as the, and that last bullet is not showing for me, sorry. Um, they need wide and deep uh, marshes. And by deep, I mean from the upland ecotone to open water, deep that way, not depth of the water. Um, and then wide, because that decreases that edge effect from development. And the more uh, complex the channel system is, 
the better. Um, the more sinuous the, the channels and more places basically to hide for these um, species, the better. And then microhabitats, it's important to preserve the microhabitats, especially the uh, listed plants along the right side of the of this slide. They really rely on very specific components of the tidal marsh, um, primarily at the upper upper marsh band. Uh, and so we need to remember when we're doing restoration to incorporate those those elements into restoration. Uh, and then, so besides besides that we have to, per Endangered Species Act and other regulations, why should we care about the species? And, you know, for this one, if you asked 50 people, you'd probably get 50 answers. Um, but to me, um, having those species present on the landscape indicates that the system is working, um, that it's fully functional, healthy, and it's benefiting everyone. Um, everyone's probably heard of the canary in the coal mine analogy. Um, these species can be and, and are the early indicators of the health of our, of our ecosystem and of, of the bay um, to even the human occupants. So um, we can, we can you know, get an early indication that something's off, something's wrong. And, and in fact, we have seen those indicators for a while. And then finally, um, having the species present indicates a biodiverse landscape. Um, and when you've got biodiversity, um, you've got resilience. And so the more resilient we are moving into existential threats like climate change, the better, the better we all are, um, including the human occupants. So, and then finally, a quote that I like, which is um, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering by Aldo Leopold. Um, and I should mention, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back, um, that it's not just that these species are um, native. I think Julian spoke to that So there's so many um, native species and especially tidal marsh birds that rely, rely on the San Francisco estuary. They're not just, they're not just native, but they're endemic. Um, and so it's, you know, there's something to be said that, that the community communities that live around San Francisco Bay can hold these up as um, symbols of the health of their environment and kind of mascots. Uh, we come back to the, the quote here uh, from the Begu, we call it the Begu document in 2015. And that's um, that by, by 2030, we really need to keep that siren call um, present in our minds because um, we need to get these tidal marshes established by then. And marshes can take a while, decades sometimes, to uh, fully establish. So we really need to accelerate the funding and streamline the implementation of projects that restore the balance to tidal action. And, and that's something that the BRIT uh, team that I'm on is really working um, hard toward uh, because restoration really does mean huge wins for um, the species and human occupants of the bay. And so uh, there are many, uh, or there's a handful at least of, of really comprehensive restoration guiding documents uh, in the bay right now. And, and for the Fish and Wildlife Service, this is our guiding document. It's the recovery plan for tidal marsh ecosystems of Northern and Central California. It was published in 2013 and it is available online I think later I have um, the link listed. So like all recovery plans, it is um, voluntary. It's not a regulatory document. Um, and the benefit of that is that anybody can participate and I'll circle around to that in a minute. Um, if, you, if you pull up the plan uh, that's available online, you can um, see that it's broken down into these basic elements. Um, there's an introduction to the ecosystem, tidal marsh ecosystem, and then um, you know we go into some detail on the threats that caused the species to be listed initially under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, and then we talk, go into more detail on the natural history and what these species actually need to survive and to recover to previous population levels. Uh, we set out baywide, regional, and local recovery strategies, so kind of a three-tiered approach. Um, and that is how do we, the strategy is kind of how we will get at recovering the species. And then we have quantitative recovery criteria per species to say, what does it look like when you get to that point? 
Uh, and then we also have time and cost estimates um, included in there. And then a, a major component of this I'll circle back around to is the, the table in the back of the document talks about very specific recovery actions that can be undertaken by any number of organizations or individuals. Um, and that's that's a real important component of, of that. The, the overarching strategies of the recovery plan are you know, to, to acquire and protect um, lands around the bay, um, the restoration and management of those lands. And uh, it also includes very specific maps as to where restoration could occur. And, and kind of like the adaptation atlas, it's it's a menu of options. Not It's in this case, not uh, necessarily true that land has to be restored right here to this um, habitat type in order for the species to recover, but it's it's something to think about and something to, um, to a menu to shoot for, uh, to pull from. Uh, also species surveys and monitoring, um, that is a major component of the, of the strategy. We need to know where we are um, in reaching our goal. And then research that's required for um, each of the species and habitats. And then a really important element, which is the coordination and outreach um, to the community, because um, nothing like this happens but with one single person or organization. Um, and along those lines, uh, right after publication of the document, we uh, put together a recovery implementation team uh, called a RIT. Uh, many of you are familiar with that. It's, it's um, comprised of invited members and it's broken into three working groups, uh, two for each of the animal species and one for the plants. And they, they are in fact um, working now and have been even prior to uh, these people and others have been working on implementation in the Bay um, that can lead to recovery, move the needle of recovery for these species. And whether it's you know, a small restoration project, a uh, community-based activity, or a policy level um, action. The work has already started, but there's so much more uh, work to be done. And all organizations and individuals can participate and you can participate in some way. Um, and so here's a link to the, the um, Tidal Marsh Recovery Plan. I know it's kind of a long link. Um, and technically, uh, my coworker Steve Detweiler is the is the division chief, so he's technically in charge of the recovery plan and its implementation team. Um, so if you have questions, it should go to him. But um, I've got his contact information here at the bottom of the screen. Let's see. Um, one important thing about the recovery plan and having and having. Um, actions listed, specific actions listed is that folks have told us it helps to leverage funds um, in other places that, that it's listed here, at, you know, in the back of the document. And so um, what folks can do is, again, that implementation table in the back is they can flip to the back, say you're in a particular region of the Bay and you've got discretionary funds to use, you can really just flip to your area in the, in the table in the back of the recovery plan and, and figure out an action that, that you'd like to fund or be a part of. So um, very user friendly. And, you know, in the theme of partnerships, here's a, a selection of types of um, partners that we work with regularly, at least on the BRIT. Um, it's not exhaustive. Uh, the point is that there are so many passionate organizations working toward the goal of a healthy bay. Um, Point Blue and so many others know this um, intimately, but we're working now on compiling the data and getting it usable, learning from past restoration projects, um, standardizing monitoring protocols that um, help us survey those species in a, in a standard way that can be compared um, year over year. And then we're using that, um, those, and, and they're developing other tools to help us achieve that goal. And so we really want to learn from past restoration in order to um, improve restorations moving forward. And as has been noted, these nature-based solutions um, are just um, being, being implemented as part of all projects now, as far as I know, um, living shorelines, barrier beaches, ecotone levees or horizontal levees, um, eelgrass restoration and beneficial reuse of sediment, uh, along with oyster beds and, and so many other um, design approaches that are more natural and, you know, will in the end probably be cheaper than the traditional ways of, of doing um, resilience projects. 
um, and they really work with the natural forces. So uh, I'm so excited to see those and to be working on them um, through the BRIT. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there are a couple state initiatives that the BRIT really um, complements, uh, one of them being the Cutting the Green Tape initiative, and then the other, the California 30 by 30, which is even more recent, and it's the initiative to protect 30% of the state's waters and lands by 2030. So it really ties in well with this. Um, as Julian mentioned, we're seeing restoration successes on the landscape um, in several areas now that there's been, um, you know, in some cases, decades of data coming through. Um, one in particular is at uh, Sonoma Creek. Um, it's also part of the refuge. Um, and that was just a few years ago. They did a restoration project there where they um, let in the tidal flows, restored the fully functional flows, and they built an ecotone and California Ridgeways rail were not there previously and have been um, cited in recent years. So it's really, really exciting to me. Um, in essence, this all to say, um, these efforts have to be done as a whole. It, it has, it takes all of us um, and these major partnerships to, to get this work done and we have to be adaptive. Uh, while we're doing it. So that's really it. Aside from some takeaways, um, to please spread the word about the value of wetlands. Tell your, your friends and neighbors about the sensitive species that are living in your area, um, in the places where you love to go, and, um, and their needs. Um, share, share their needs, uh, those species needs. Volunteer with your ongoing um, restoration initiatives in, the, in your community and support your local legislature on bay conservation issues. Um, this is the link to the BRITS webpage and my contact information. You can feel free to contact me anytime with questions about um, federally listed species and um, I'll be hanging around for the panel and I really appreciate uh, being invited to speak today. Thank you. Next up is Christina Tomes, who is an ecological engineer and senior scientist with the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board. Welcome, Christina. Great, thank you, James. Thank you, everyone. So hi, everyone. My name is Christina Toms. I'm an ecological engineer and senior environmental scientist at the Water Board, um, which has the privilege of having the most fun name of all the regulatory agencies in the region. And I'm gonna talk about how tidal wetlands and nature-based infrastructure support a clean, healthy bay. Okay, so um, first I really wanna do a brief territory acknowledgement. Um, I'm gonna be discussing lands uh, in the region that have been stolen from indigenous peoples, um, including the Ohlone, Miwok, and Patwin tribes. The colonization of these lands is ongoing um, for lots of reasons. Um, one of them is that few of these tribes are federally recognized. So the Water Board derives its jurisdictional authority from a number of laws, um, including the Federal Clean Water Act, which was actually inspired by water uh, pollution control legislation here in California, the Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act, um, as well as basin plan policies in, uh, in the San Francisco Bay uh, Water Quality Control Plan, the Water Quality Control Plan for the San Francisco Bay Basin, which is basically our Bible. And this Bible has lots of chapters. Uh, chapter two describes beneficial uses of San Francisco Bay, which are basically the functions and the services that are provided by a clean, healthy bay. Um, chapter three of this basin plan describes the water quality objectives. So these are qualitative and quantitative objectives um, to support those beneficial uses. And then chapter four of the basin plan describes implementation plans, which is how are we gonna get there? How are we going to achieve those water quality objectives so that we can support those beneficial uses. And one of the great things about going at the end of a session um, with so many of my illustrious colleagues is that they've already covered half of this for me. So I'll try to get through this quickly so we can get through the Q&A. So what are some of the key activities that the Water Board regulates in the region? Uh, I once told a commissioner on BCDC that, well, sir, frankly, if it's wet, we regulate it. Um, and that's kind of true. Uh, we regulate the placement of fill in wetlands and waters. We regulate the dredging and beneficial reuse of sediment. We regulate the discharge of treated wastewater from municipal facilities and industrial facilities, both near shore and offshore. We manage stormwater, and we're also responsible for the cleanup of polluted sites, including near shore groundwater sites. So what are some of the key beneficial uses that the Water Board is charged with protecting in the San Francisco Bay region and in the Bay and its wetlands. So uh, among, and these are actually like listed beneficial uses in the basin plan. So one of these is obviously estuarine habitats, the mud flats, the tidal marshes that we've been hearing about so much today. 
providing habitat for rare and native and special status species, um, and also supporting recreation, commercial fishing, uh, or commercial fisheries, shellfish harvesting. These are all explicit beneficial uses of San Francisco Bay and its wetlands. And I really appreciate going right after Valerie. She spoke a lot about our rare and special status species, um, not just the Ridgeways rail and the salt marsh harvest mouse that you've heard about so much, but also um, fish such as Chinook salmon and rare plants such as salt marsh bird's beak. I'm also one of the directors of the California Native Plant Society. So I'm contractually obligated to tell you that Really in the edges of the bay, it's not just the rare plants um, that are important for conservation, but also rare tidal wetland ecotypes. So when we talk about, you know, rare enlisted species, those are, you know, it, species, uh, you know, very distinct populations, which we know we have, uh, you know, they're, they're very small populations and they have very limited distribution. But the same is true of some common plant species that live in strange or unusual or rare places in the landscape. And there's actually a lot of those around the edges of San Francisco Bay. So for example, these are yellow rayed gold fields. Many of you have probably seen gold fields up in our uplands and our grasslands. Um, but where vernal, vernal pools and freshwater wetlands used to be adjacent to salt marshes or, or are adjacent to salt marshes, um, this is a, a rare ecotype. Um, so I want folks to think about the importance of that landscape connectivity. I'm sure Letitia is going to talk a lot about that uh, in the next um, session that the Sierra Club is, is hosting, but really think about landscape connectivity when it comes to these ecosystems. They provide protection from waves and floods. We've talked about how important it is to have tidal marshes um, and other nature-based infrastructure in front of our built communities to help protect them from, uh, from waves and, and levee overtopping. Um, and they really critically provide water quality improvement. And that's gonna be the focus of my talk today. Um, and going after Patty, she's su such a phenomenal scientist. I really appreciate her talk and, and um, how she made it really clear about the carbon sequestration benefits of tidal marshes. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these, um, these other functions, um, particularly the biogeochemical processes that lead us to often talk about tidal marshes as the kidneys of the bay. Um, I like to drink wine. I live up in wine country, so I also like to think of them perhaps as the liver of the bay. Um, but the, it really cannot be overstated how critical wetlands are to water quality. And that's for lots of different reasons, um, but mostly because of this very unique biogeochemistry that wetlands have, where they have this coupling of aerobic and anaerobic so, so uh, soils with oxygen and soils without oxygen. Um, and that coupling allows for a lot of very complex biogeochemical cycles um, that don't happen or that happen to a much reduced degree in terrestrial habitats. And so denitrification is a huge one, the removal of, of nitrogen um, and basically taking uh, runoff, um, taking nitrogen from, from stormwater runoff and, and um, from wastewater and actually turning it into gaseous nitrogen so actually getting it up out of the water column, getting it up out of the landscape and into that atmospheric reservoir. Now, we know that wetlands are really good at doing this, um, at, at, at doing denitrification, at removing other pollutants such as metals and uh, um, you know, other uh, co complex uh, uh, pollutants. Um, and we've used that knowledge to develop treatment wetlands throughout the Bay. Um, and here, these are pictures of some uh, polishing wetlands, um, one at the uh, Las Galinas uh, treatment plant in San Rafael, um, in Martinez at the Hayward Marsh, um, in Petaluma at the Ellis Creek facility. Um, wetlands are really, really good at removing lots of compounds that don't come out, that aren't removed through traditional wastewater and stormwater treatment processes. And again, it's that those unique environmental conditions that make them um, particularly well suited to treating um, lots of very common pollutants in the bay. Now, the problem is that, as my colleagues have very well illustrated to you, is that we've pretty much eliminated almost all of the tidal wetlands around the edge of San Francisco Bay, between 80 and 90%, depending on how you account for centennial marshes. And so not only have we eliminated all of the marsh, most of the marshes around San Francisco Bay, but we've colonized our landscape such that um, we're releasing tremendous amounts of different types of pollutants. So we've got urbanization, agriculture, and tidal wetland reclamation, reclamation has led to, to a polluted bay. And many common nutrients, um, including nutrients nutrients, metals, PCBs, dioxin, organics, emerging contaminants, microplastics, 
um, these are all uh, a, an issue throughout almost the entire bay. And for that reason, um, or for many reasons, um, this water board is collaborating um, with numerous stakeholders in the region and has been for decades on a regional monitoring program. And we keep a very close eye on water and sediment in the bay, bivalve tissue to see what contaminants are bioaccumulating in the estuarine food web, sport fish tissue, cormorants and turn eggs to really understand um, how are these contaminants, uh, what are the pathways, what are the sources, what are the loadings into the bay, and how are they integrating or not into the food web? So nutrients uh, is a real big focus of, of the water board uh, and our stakeholders right now. Um, some of you may have heard about eutrophication. Perhaps you've heard about this uh, within the context of Mississippi, Mississippi River uh, drainage basin um, and the, the loss of oxygen down at the mouth in the Gulf of Mexico. But it's basically a process whereby nutrient enrichment leads to algal blooms and die-offs, and that leads to the development of tremendously low dissolved oxygen that can kill aquatic life. Now, we've got an interesting situation here in San Francisco Bay where we are certainly nutrient enriched with how urbanized of an estuary we are. Um, we have a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in the system, um, but we're not quite eutrophic yet. And that's likely due to a combination of factors that are really complex to tease out. And that includes tidal mixing, the fact that we have a shallow, very well-mixed estuary that helps to uh, uh, support um, pretty robust dissolved oxygen concentrations, um, even at the bottom of the bay. Um, we have light limitation from high turbidity. We have a lot of suspended sediment moving around in the estuary. That makes it hard for light to penetrate deep into the water column, which makes it harder for algal blooms to form. And we also have a lot of um, uh, 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 non-native non uh, clams um, and other uh, uh, bivalves that exert a lot of grazing pressure on the algae in the water column and, and, and help um, keep blooms from getting out of hand. Um, however, there's preliminary evidence that climate change is really beginning to shift the baseline of primary productivity in the estuary. And this could have really important ramifications for the potential of the bay to become eutrophic in the future. Um, and so this is something that the water board is really closely keeping an eye on. Another thing we're closely monitoring are emerging contaminants. And these are pollutants that, again, aren't treated very well in traditional wastewater treatment plants. And they're pollutants that we're only really beginning to understand the ramifications of their persistence in the environment. So this, is complex, this includes complex organic compounds, things like pesticides and herbicides, um, but pharmaceuticals as well. Um, and these are uh, increasingly a, a big deal in our municipal um, wastewater streams. Um, drugs such as antibiotics, painkillers, contraception, um, complex molecules that just aren't broken down in traditional wastewater treatment plants. Now, we know that we've already lost most of the wetlands around the edge of the bay, and folks have already today, and I, I know you're going to hear more about this in the subsequent sessions, um, it, it's not looking great for the tidal marshes around the estuary in the future, um, particularly if we see a future where, we're, where we have limited sediment supplies and very high rates of, of sea level rise. And um, you'll probably see this graphic again. Um, you know, this is work done by Lisa Sheely a couple years ago, um, showing that over time, a transition from robust, healthy high marsh, that bright green color, to low mat or low marsh, that light green color, and potentially mud flat, the brown color, um, if we don't have enough suspended sediment and high rates of sea level rise. So we have multiple challenges. We've got historic and potential future losses of tidal marshes, degraded water quality. We have natural and built communities that are vulnerable to flooding and erosion. We've lost habitat. And I really want to hammer this home. We've got limited green, green space for marginalized and minoritized urban communities, and including to support cultural use by tribes. So multiple challenges require multi-benefit solutions. And one example of these, you've heard it talked about a little bit so far today, is the horizontal levee. And so this is a, a graphic of a subsurface seepage levee um, where we're basically taking uh, treated wastewater and using that treated wastewater, um, applying it to an ecotone slope and allowing that subsurface seepage of treated wastewater to go over, or excuse me, to go um, underneath subsurface um, through the levee uh, slope um, and basically recreating that natural freshwater saltwater gradient that used to exist throughout the edges of the bay. This um, approach has been tested at Oraloma. It's currently being rolled out in a couple other locations at full scale um, uh, projects um, in the Bay 
And again, so it's recreating these fresh to salt marsh gradients that can help support not only our rare and native species, but again, also those rare ecotypes, um, those species that live at that ecotone between freshwater and saltwater marsh. Horizontal levees, um, the research that's been done so far at Oraloma has demonstrated that they're incredibly effective at removing nutrients and other pollutants, um, particularly when flow is limited to the subsurface and not to the surface. That leads to short hydraulic short circuiting, and that really limits the treatment efficacy of these wetlands. Um, but these are some graphs from a recent paper um, uh, by a, a, a team at, at, at Cal and Stanford, including one of my former professors, David Sedlak, and uh, showing just how effective uh, the horizontal levee is at removing removing nitrate, trace organics, um, even viruses um, are very effectively removed by the horizontal levy. Horizontal levees can help reduce the ultimate size of flood, ri flood risk management levees behind them, landward of them. Um, Julie talked about this, a lot of the other speakers. Um, and they provide accessible green space. And I want to hammer this home because for so many of our urban and marginalized minoritized communities, tidal wetlands along the edge of the bay are some of the most accessible green space. And if we've Hopefully we've learned lots of things over the last year and a half, but I think one of the things that many of us have come to recognize is just how crucial open space and green space are um, to our mental and our physical health. And so it's really important, especially in our urban communities, that we have access to nature um, to support community health. Um, and I had to, th um, these are photos from a Bay Nature article about the Oraloma horizontal levy. Um, I think this is a great photo of Jeremy and please uh, make sure that you see his talk. He's gonna talk about Oraloma and a number of other nature-based approaches on May 27th. So just to let you know what the Water Board is doing um, to further support um, analysis of where horizontal levees may be appropriate throughout the estuary, we're supporting San the San Francisco Estuary Institute to develop the next phase of the Adaptation Atlas. We were the primary funder for the first phase. We're continuing to fund it for subsequent phases. Um, phase two is taking a closer look um, at precisely where in the estuary we have kind of that confluence of, of geomorphically appropriate space along the shoreline and proximity to wastewater treatment plants that can help support horizontal levees throughout the region. And this is a very preliminary analysis. Um, frankly, it's a document that I have to review. Uh, it's on my desk, um, but I'm really grateful to SFEI for doing this work. Here's an example of the analysis that they're doing, showing in the Alameda and Maori OLUs where horizontal um, levees may be appropriate, and especially where they might be appropriate um, near wastewater treatment facilities. So in summary, the historic and potential future losses of tidal marshes around the Bay really negatively impact Lots of beneficial uses, but especially water quality, habitats, flood, vulnerabil flood vulnerability, and cultural and historic or cultural and recreational uses. Um, and to solve these, multi to address these multiple challenges, we really need multiple benefit strategies, including but certainly not limited to horizontal levees. They're a great solution. They are not appropriate for everywhere in the bay. This came up a little bit in our previous discussion of, of Foster City, but in geomorphically appropriate regions of the bay. Um, they could be a, a, a very excellent multi-benefit solution. And work is ongoing at the Water Board at SFEI with our partners and stakeholders, um, BACWA, um, Bay Area Clean Water Agencies, to figure out what is the optimal location and design of these systems um, throughout the region. So uh, thanks to my many collaborators. And if you have any questions, we'll take them in the Q&A, but please don't hesitate to reach out to me individually. Um, there's my email right there. Thank you, Christina. Next, we'll have a uh, panel Q&A. Um, so please make sure you send in your questions through the, um, the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, first question we have is from Ken Branson. At what point does carbon capture into the soil head toward an equilibrium where the pace of capture slows down and eventually stops. Uh, second question following on that is, uh, and how confident can we be about maintaining that storage versus it being short-term storage at high risk of being released again? Who would like to feel that? I could, I could uh, give a first response. So, um, okay, so tidal wetlands are different than other types of ecosystems. Um, so if you think of like an upland forest type of system, you're gonna have you know, net carbon um, removal until the forest reaches maturity. And then it reaches this equilibrium point where it takes in carbon every year and it releases carbon every year. Wetlands are fundamentally different. And so they continue to sequester carbon and deposit in, into the soil. And that's because of this 
um, the soils are flooded. And so the carbon that gets trapped there um, doesn't break down and it gets stored for long periods. It's like what you end up is with these layers upon layers. And you can, you can take um, sediment cores and look into these um, historic wetlands and, and see how old the carbon is as you go down and down and down. Um, um, times when you would actually potentially lose that or disrupt that um, natural carbon accumulation cycle is if sea level rise gets extremely fast um, and so there are some scenarios right now where sea level rise could be could get um, really, really high quickly and that can flood out the wetland and basically um, flood out the plants and then stop that and interrupt that process. Also, also, obviously, if you were to, you know, build on that wetland, dredge it up, drain it, um, use it for a different purpose, like oxidize those soils, you'll get release of that carbon. So it's um, by no means is it guaranteed and permanent forever. So you have to manage these tidal wetlands, uh, maintain them. And, um, you know, we've done some modeling, for example, for some of the wetlands like at Eden Landing Ecological Reserve, um, where you can look into 100 years from now with different sea level rise scenarios. And for most of the moderate ones, uh, tidal wetlands are still there 100 years from now. That's not true everywhere in the Bay, um, but like it's been emphasized many times today is the best time to do this is now. And there's this you know, pretty small window of um, if we wait too long and build these 30 years from now, right, it's gonna be a lot harder. So it's best to get them going now, get them established, places like Eden Landing where they've been established for a long time and are now in this cycle of and we've done cores in our site and looking at um, this carbon accretion and how it's really taking off and as the plant community gets established and the sediments getting trapped and things like that. But, but yes, as long as you manage it, it doesn't necessarily reach an equilibrium. It continues to put down carbon and can store that for, uh, like I said earlier, millennial time scales. Uh, next question up is from Gladwin D'Souza who writes, would removing roads reduce contaminants to the bay? And is there a uh, map of geomorphically appropriate areas of the bay for horizontal levee? Well, I would say um, <laughs> the roads are a symptom. Uh, the problem is the people. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, uh, it's not so much um, the presence of roads um, as how they're designed and, and how they're managed, and particularly how their stormwater is managed. Um, so the water board, we have a number of mechanisms through which we regulate stormwater, and we work very closely with municipal communities, um, Caltrans, uh, other partners to figure out how to uh, reduce the impact of roads and related infrastructure on, uh, on stormwater. Um, and uh, how to reduce contaminant loads um, from those facilities. Um, if you go to our website, we have a whole section on green infrastructure um, and how um, uh, and green green stormwater management and how we can retrofit um, our, our urban environment, um, including through the use of, of wetlands and seasonal detention basins and, and things of that nature um, to treat stormwater so that we can reduce the impacts of, of that infrastructure on water quality in the Bay. Um, well, yeah, in, in regard to the ecotone question and whether there's a map, um, the, the recovery plan for tidal marsh um, ecosystems has detailed maps um, showing, showing in some areas of the bay where it might be an appropriate spot for uh, to put in ecotones, um, where there is development a little further back from the edge of the bay. And then I think the adaptation atlas um, as well lays out some areas. Yeah, sorry, I completely forgot about the second half of that question. Um, yes, so uh, the phase one uh, adaptation at, uh, atlas report, which you can find on the SFEI website, if you go to sfei.org forward slash adaptation atlas, um, has a preliminary analysis of where throughout the bay it would be geomorphically appropriate to have a horizontal levee. We are refining that. So those maps that I showed at the end of my presentation, that's a product that is in development right now. Um, in general, horizontal levees are most well suited for lower energy, lower energy portions of the bay um, where there's abundant outboard mudflat. Um, we want to avoid having a situation where horizontal levees are adjacent to deeper waters, higher wave action, um, places where there's a likelihood that the toe of that horizontal levee would be impacted by waves and would, would erode and would begin to peel back. Um, and so, uh, so you need you need space, 
um, you, you, you need a certain amount of space, you need a certain amount of, of wave sheltering. Um, and, and the Adaptation Atlas gets into that. And like I said, when we release um, that next uh, phase document, um, you'll see updated maps that, that um, uh, are a more refined analysis. Next question up is from Vicki Hoover, who asked, how is the work of Bay Tidal Marsh restoration by various agencies being coordinated with the state's new program of natural climate solutions and a pathway to 30 by 30? And I can take that if, uh, or at least a first shot. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm a federal, I'm on the federal side, I'm not the state side, um, and I'm a permitter. So I, I'm permitting um, through section seven consultation for listed species, um, these projects. So we're not actually doing the project, but we um, have the ability um, and, and, and the charge to um, help projects reduce the effect on listed species. And a lot of times using these natural um, adaptation elements gets at that and can reduce impacts to the species. So in that way, um, we are there to encourage projects to do that uh, on the landscape. But honestly, so far through the BRIT, all the projects we've seen have brought some element of, of that to, to the project. And we've maybe refined it a little, but um, as far as the details about those two initiatives, I'm not the best one to ask since I'm on the federal side, but um, definitely, you know, in terms of protecting 30% of the land and waters by 2030, um, the recovery plan does complement that initiative in that we call out for the protection and you know acquisition or protection by easement or whatever. Land is expensive in the Bay. Um, so I think the recovery plan gets at that as well and can help the state uh, reach that goal. I'll attempt to uh, add to that um, from the state point of view. Um, the, the 30 by 30 you know, initiative is, is, is a relatively kind of newer way, I think, of articulating what a lot of us have been advocating for a long time, which is landscape conservation um, at a landscape scale. Um, recognizing that this kind of postage stamp approach to protecting and restoring lands um, is not as effective um, as it could be if you think in terms of, of broader landscapes and figuring out how the health of, for example, tidal marshes um, is closely tied to not just the tidal marsh itself being protected, but the watershed upslope of it being protected and being connected and the bay downstream being protected and connected. This is something that the Baylands Ecosystem Habitat Goals Update 2015 document um, gets into uh, 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 to a, it's kind of the, the point of the whole document. Um, and so I'd actually argue that the tidal wetland restoration community in the estuary is a little ahead, frankly, of this 30 by 30 framework because we've been thinking at a landscape scale um, for quite some time. Now the challenge, um, in the Bay is that we have a highly urbanized estuary. We have relatively limited opportunities to connect our tidal wetlands to natural upslope edges, to, uh, to creeks and rivers. We've, we've really disconnected our watersheds from, from our baylands. Um, and so the challenge is really taking a landscape scale look at the entire estuary and saying, where are the opportunities to connect landscapes now so that they can continue to be connected in the future and not be these strange isolated patches of habitat um, within a, a, a highly urbanized you know, matrix. Um, so I think that's certainly the way that the water board is thinking about things. Um, we have a new basin plan amendment that I'm working on that's gonna articulate this a, a little more clearly. Uh, um, and so you know, I, would, I would encourage um, folks uh, to um, uh, you know, to, to to stay you know politically engaged and make sure that when you're talking about tidal wetland restoration and conservation, that we're really thinking long-term landscape scale. When it comes to like meeting our climate goals, um, within that 30 by 30, they talk about how the California Air Resources Board should be considering these sorts of things in in meeting our climate our goals of carbon neutrality by 2045. And so they also just recommended to adopt into the compliance market this tidal restoration greenhouse gas methodology. So we're potentially, they're going to be potentially, you know, supporting that and um, helping finance and support the uh, wetland restoration 
Also, there was a, a really great report that came out of Lawrence Livermore National Lab called Getting to Neutral, in which they over go over, and I had a figure of that in my talk, but they go over all of you know the negative emissions we need to get to get to, to neutrality and what role all these different types of um, land management strategies can play in that. And they point out and explicitly talk about tidal wetland restoration in that report and put numbers on it. So they said, you know, about 1.1 million tons of CO2 per year could be sequestered by tidal wetlands across the state. So they actually put numbers on this. And so um, there is some coordination going on in, in, in that regard that I know of. Thank you. Um, next question is for Patty. Uh, ask, uh, how can cities incorporate wetlands sequester into climate action plans? How can they incorporate wetlands into climate action plans? So yeah, so um, I guess by that you mean bringing in the carbon that and accounting for the carbon that's being sequestered by their shoreline wetlands and their wetland restoration projects and using those as a way of, um, you know, reducing their overall um, emissions to the atmosphere. And I think that's a really important thing. I think the biggest, uh, you know, you know, obstacle for that right now is actually quantifying these emissions. They're hard to quantify and they're hard to measure. And so that's why we've been working on, you know, getting models and modeling tools out there for people to, to better um, and accurately estimate what their greenhouse gas um, balances are for their shoreline. Uh, next question is for Christina. Does polishing water to clean allow us to use recycled water for more uses? That's a great question. Um, so yes, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, California is an arid state and uh, there was a great op-ed in the LA Times the other day about how a you know, this isn't exactly a drought. This is more a, 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 a baseline shift in, in California uh, being an arid environment. Um, so water resources are, are really critical. Um, and so there are multiple examples um, already uh, in the region of um, wetlands being used to, to polish wastewater um, and utilize it as recycled water. Um, so for example, a number of the facilities that I that I showed, um, I, I, I want to specifically call out the Las Galinas and, and Ellis Creek uh, facilities. Um, they, the, the, the wastewater goes through those polishing wetlands and then is utilized as recycled water um, to, uh, you know, irrigate hay fields and irrigate golf courses and, and things like that. Um, there is also a possibility um, for treatment wetlands uh, to play a role in, in uh, potable reuse. Um, that's actually something that's been done in Southern California, uh, the Prado wetlands. Um, have been around for quite a while, and they're used to polish treated wastewater, which is then injected into a groundwater aquifer, and then farther down gradient, that water is then um, uh, um, uh, pulled out and used as, as a drinking water source um, in, in Orange County. Um, so uh, there, there's definitely a role uh, for them for them to play. Um, for potable reuse, there's a number of different treatment stages that you would need. You would need more than just a treatment wetland in some cases um, to get to that kind of, of level of treatment. Um, but certainly with regards to, um, uh, uh, you know, removing a uh, you know certain contaminants and and uh, and nitrogen, um, you know phosphorus. Uh, there, there's absolutely a role that they could play. And and I would add that if you're interested in learning more about this, um, there's a, a, a there's an advanced water purification facility that's being tested um, down. Uh, Valley Water has it. Um, I think John dropped off, dropped off, but um, I I don't believe that's using polishing wetlands as part of its treatment process. But um, perhaps in the future uh, they could be. Thank you. And we have just one minute left for a quick answer. Um, Ashley asked, how do we deal with the challenge of scaling up and combining these wetland restoration carbon sequestration projects to make them viable on the carbon market? Um, so my understanding is one of the, yes, one of the barriers of making these viable is that if you have a really small wetland, um, let's say you have managers um, managing a small area um, to participate in the carbon market, you need to do all the monitoring yourself, right? So you need to either 
you know, consult, take cores or make measurements or use a model, whatever it is, you need to display and show that you're quantifying your carbon offsets and in order to participate in the market. So that can be really expensive. But when you bundle and group together wetland projects, then you can start to um, share the cost of that monitoring and calculation across larger areas. And then it makes it much cheaper on a you know, per acre basis. And so there's talks of doing that. You know, they do this for a lot of carbon markets right now are forests. Um, they do this for large areas and forests. And I think I definitely think that's a really good question. It needs to be um, we need to group together and work together in order to make things more viable and, and work on larger scales. I think that's part of one of the biggest obstacles that I'm aware of. Thank you very much. So um, to end, I would just like to express again our gratitude to all the presenters for generously sharing their time and knowledge to help us all make a positive legacy. I also want to thank the incredible, nearly indefatigable Sierra Club volunteers who are largely responsible for organizing this webinar series. And also thanks to Sierra Club staff who provided critical support, including Dashiell Leeds, Justina Guterman, and especially Donna Knapp. Uh, please be sure to join us for the next two webinars on the next Thursdays, uh, May 20th and 27th. Remember that your, your, the link you use for this meeting will work for all of those other uh, webinars. And all the recordings will be on the um, uh, Loma Prieta Chapter YouTube channel. You can just search YouTube for Loma Prieta Chapter. Um, please take 30 seconds to help us improve our work by responding to the survey you will receive. And again, thank you for your participation today. Hopefully this webinar series will indeed help you create a positive legacy that, as Sir Attenborough says, will profoundly affect the next few centuries. So let's seize the day to protect the bay. Thank you very much.